a call for violence against Trump supporters from an elected official? I'm not even surprised anymore. Plus, we have a spy story, intrigue, there's women involved, it's crazy, and something that may touch your heart. All that's coming up next. How violent is our political system? Think about it. Take a minute and think about how violent our political system is. Because I think that you and I tend to live in not a world of make-believe. That's not fair. And believe me, I'm pointing fingers at myself, too. We, as people on the right, or at least leaning right, although I know I have a bunch of Democrats who watch, people, even center Democrats, we tend to have a loftier view of America. Not loftier than we deserve. America should be held up high in your mind. Believe me, you're dang blessed to be here. But we have a lofty view of how we are now, of how we were in the past, of where we stand now as a nation, of what our political violence situation is like. We look overseas at some violent coup in some third world dump we'd never want to visit. And we say to ourselves, <laughs> those barbarians, wish they had it figured out like we do. Free and fair elections down the line. Nobody even gets hurt here. One, that's not historically accurate. Political violence has always been mixed in in the United States of America. At one point in time, somebody in Congress beat someone else in Congress with a cane almost to death, and the guy who did the beating, instead of being forced to resign in shame, was sent a whole new batch of canes from his constituents because they were so excited he did it. We had members of, of you know, the political class dueling to the death with pistols. Now, I understand violence is inherent in politics because really politics is competition. Politics is about money and power. And anytime you get money and power and politics in, 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 involved in something, well, when the stakes are high enough, you're going to have violence. I think you're not fully understanding, though, how violent things already are now. Uh, we somehow have blocked out that right after Trump got elected, we had a Bernie Sanders supporter for political reasons gather up a bunch of weapons and try to commit a mass murder against Republican members of Congress on a baseball field. By the grace of God, he did not succeed. Many were wounded, obviously, but he didn't succeed. And he stated, it's not like he hid his motives. This was about politics. We've had... How many murders? I don't mean something random like the left does and they assign it for political motivations. We've had how many politically motivated murders? Assaults? Attempted murders? Threats of assault? We are moving into an era now where you're going to have to stop denying where we actually are. The only reason you and I can live in this alternate reality now is actually because of the media we have in this country. If there's even a whiff of right-wing violence, the media will cover it to the ends of the earth to try to present people on the right as these violent white supremacists. But the truth is this. The left is violent. It is inherently violent. And it's not violent because all leftists are bad people. I may disagree with them. You may disagree with them. It's not because they're bad people. It's because human beings, the history of the world tells us, human beings will commit acts of violence on behalf of their religion. They will. People have perverted religions for, for different reasons across the globe since the beginning of mankind, and they've done it, well, violently. People will do anything on behalf of their religion, on behalf of their God. They will. The Aztecs used to sacrifice children by the thousand, alive, cutting their hearts out. I know that's gross, but that's what people will do on behalf of their religion. And leftism is not a political ideology. You, somebody on the right, you have a political ideology. You love politics, you consume politics, you watch my show, you, you probably listen to radio shows, you, that's what you do. But it's only part of your life, right? It's part of your life. You got family, church, everything else in your life. You compartmentalize. 
Leftists don't think like that because leftists believe in their religion just as much as you believe in, believe in yours. It consumes everything for them, and they will commit acts of violence for it. And now, because the left is in such a position of cultural control, let's remember this. Remember all the things they own. They bring you the news. They educate your children. They occupy the highest levels of the federal bureaucracy. They make your movies. They make your TV shows. They make your music. They have one of the two political parties in its entirety. They have at least half of the other political party. They have it all. They have corporate America now because corporate America now is occupied by people who came through the education system learning from these people. The left is in such a position of power that they want to use it. Leftists use their power now. We convinced ourselves, and I'm guilty of this too, while Donald Trump was president, that, well, I mean, look, things are bad, but it's, you know, it's 50-50. We're right there. I mean, yeah, they have some things we want, but we have a lot of things too. Things are fine. This is the one thing that gives me comfort with the likely swearing in of Joe Biden. The one thing that gives me comfort about it is now we can stop lying to ourselves about where we are. They're cinched in now. You feel surrounded because you are surrounded culturally. They own all of it. And when they say things like this lady, Cynthia Johnson, says, I'm going to show it to you in a moment. Remember, Democrats mean what they say. Unlike Republicans who will defund Planned Parenthood. Just, just send your $50 and make sure we get Congress back. And this time it's different. This time we'll defund it. That's Republicans. Democrats? They mean what they say. When this Democratic state representative from Michigan, Cynthia Johnson, says these things that you're about to watch her say, she's one, speaking on behalf of many of the left, and two, she means it, and she means it all the way. So this is just a warning to you Trumpers. Be careful. Walk lightly. We ain't playing with you. Enough of the shenanigans. Enough is enough. And for those of you who are soldiers, you know how to do it. Do it right. Be in order. Make them pay. I didn't make that up. And that's not some idiot on a street corner with a black mask somewhere. That's an elected official for the Democratic Party. So I don't want you to do anything, obviously. The last thing in the world I want, and I mean this, is for anybody to get hurt. But I do want you to do this. Make sure you're ready. Make sure you have prepared yourself to protect yourself and your family. These people are more aggressive now than they've been. They're more desperate. They do think they're fighting Nazis. That's not just rhetoric. They called you that for four years for a reason. Because won't, won't your con what will your conscience prevent you from doing to a Nazi? You could do anything to a Nazi, right? In their minds, they're fighting on behalf of their God. And what wouldn't you do for your God? Keep that in mind. All right. Coronavirus. I hate how politicians talk. How they talk aggravates me. Maybe I was in a sour mood last night. I doubt it. I don't remember being in a sour mood. But I saw Joe Biden say this, and something about it just drove me nuts. Watch this. First, my first 100 days is going to require, I'm going to ask for a masking plan. Everyone for the first 100 days of my administration to wear a mask. It will start with my signing an order on day one to require masks where I can under the law, like federal buildings interstate travel on planes, trains, and buses. I'll also be working with the governors and mayors to do the same in their states and their cities. We're going to require masks wherever possible. Secondly, this team, this team will help get at the latest, at the last 100 million COVID-19 vaccine, at least 100 million COVID vaccine shots into the arms of the American people in the first 100 days. 100 million shots, in the first 100 days. 
and will follow the guidance of science to get the vaccines to those most at risk. That includes healthcare professionals, people in long-term care, and as soon as possible, it will include educators. This will be the most efficient mass vaccination plan in U.S. history. A hundred million in a hundred days. A hundred days. A hundred days. Did I tell you it's going to be a hundred days? hundred days. hundred days. Let me ask you something. I'm, not, I'm, I'm really not trying to be glib. Why isn't it 104 days? Why isn't it 68 days? 81 days? 205 days? 179 days? 400 days? Is that science? Why is it 100 days? And why don't we ever ask this question? How'd you get 100 days? What do you have out there that says 100 days is all we need? You'll have to excuse me, but I'm old enough to remember 15 days to to slow the spread. (laughs) That was 9,000 years ago, wasn't it? And you know what drives me nuts? Not just the stupid political slogans, 100 million in 100 days, 100 this, 100 that. Just patch that up and put it on a bumper sticker. What drives me nuts is at the end of that 100 days, Nobody, not one member of the American press will go back to Joe Biden and say, you said 100 days. Why didn't it work? Were the scientists wrong? Were you wrong? Were you lying? Were, what, what happened? It's been 100 days. It's been 100 days. But this is what happens. This is what we've seen from the beginning of coronavirus, the complete lack of accountability. It has exposed the system for what it is. The system never holds itself accountable, ever. It can't. It's not in its nature. That idiot, Dr. Fauci, can be wrong 10,000 times. If he happens to be right once, the entire system will only talk about that and ignore all the other things. If you're part of the system, you are always taken care of. Your faults are covered up. Your successes celebrated with Nobel Peace Prizes. Once you lose your job with this administration or that administration, you walk right into the uh, job as a university professor or you work in a newsroom somewhere. You just continually stay within the system. And if you are a thorn in the system side, as Donald Trump was, it will work each and every day to purge you. And it works with the other parts of the system to purge you. Are you starting to understand what I keep telling you about about the system? I'm never going to stop harping on it because it is critical that you understand what it is and explain what it is to family and friends. Explain what it is. People have to start seeing it or we're never going to fight against it, ever. Marsha Blackburn, she's railing against the things the Democrats want in the next stimulus bill, and it's not surprising. Can you say with confidence that something is going to pass before the end of the year? Oh, I cannot, because twice we have put our legislation on the floor, which is the extra PPP and the plus up in unemployment. We could have had this done two months ago two months ago. And think about the impact, Carly, that would have on individuals who need that extra $300 a week. But basically, because you've got Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi who would rather pay, play politics than solve a problem, this has not been done. And if they think it helps them politically in races in Georgia, they're not going to do it. Uh, they're going to wait and let people suffer. And it is As I said, to me, it is absolutely disgusting. Funniest part about the stuff Schumer and Pelosi want to stuff in this stimulus bill, you know what their holdup is? What have I been telling you from the beginning? What have I told you was coming? These local Democrat mayors, these Democrat governors, they slaughtered the budgets in their own states. They torpedoed business, completely kneecapped their own tax revenue. And right now... They're all looking at their state's profit loss sheet, and they're just terrified. You see, they all run on giving things out, right? Giving things out with your money. Elect me. We'll do this. We'll raise the budget here. We have money there. And now they're looking, and oh, no, the money's all gone. Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, their holdup, they're trying to include bailouts for local and state governments with your money. All that may have made you uncomfortable. But once again, 
I'm right. Now, cyber theft, cyber crime. We have to change our thinking when it comes to crime. This cyber theft, I tried to explain this to one of my sons the other night. He was trying to understand what it was. They are clearing out people's complete finances online. Your money is online. They can get you. And if you are a homeowner, your home title is almost undoubtedly your biggest financial vulnerability. They will hack into it. They will forge your signature on it, take a loan out against it, and you're going to have to pay it back. Go to HomeTitleLock.com right now because that's the only way you can stop them. I've already signed up. Use the promo code RADIO that gets you 30 days for free. HomeTitleLock.com. We'll be back. We have a scandal in the House of Representatives, and I'm going to do the very best I can to be mature about it, to relay this entire story to you with a straight face. Let's begin. Eric Swalwell, he is a Democratic member of Congress. You may remember him for two things. One, he ran for president for about 15 minutes. Two, he's the one who farted on live television on MSNBC. I'm not making that up. If you don't believe me, you can go look at the news. All right. <laughs> it, that's, that's something that actually happened. He also apparently got himself caught up in something that looks really, really, really bad. He got to know a woman. This woman is apparently an agent of the Chinese Communist Party. She is a spy. Eric Swalwell is on the House Intelligence Committee. He's on the House Intelligence Committee. As a brief side note, I've spent enough time on Capitol Hill to know you don't just breeze through the doors of the House Intelligence Committee. This is where America's secrets are discussed. Extra security. It's a big, big deal. Okay, this woman not only got close to Swalwell, she placed an intern inside of his congressional office. And there are several accusations out there. We're waiting for all the revelations to come out to see just how close they were. There is a lot of rumor floating around. They were very, very close. Now, whatever Eric Swalwell does in his personal life, I genuinely do not, do not care. As you know, I'm a card-carrying member of the Mind Your Own Business Party. However, if a member of the House Intelligence Committee has been taken in by a Chinese spy woman, that is a really, really, really big deal and a much bigger deal than Russian collusion ever thought about being. And yet, until I brought you this story, you probably didn't even know about it. Um, this is national security at stake here. And how deep do China's tentacles go in the United States government? It's time to start asking these questions. Kevin McCarthy had this to say. Remember what we're hearing. These are Chinese spies that go down to the level of a mayor. They, they court and help a city council member become a congressman. This congressman now gets on the intel committee. They are only selected from the intel committee by the leaders of their party, meaning Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi is one of the Gang of Eight, along with myself. Did Nancy Pelosi know this had transpired when she put him on the committee? We have our Senator, Dianne Feinstein. For two decades, the personal assistant that hear all the private phone calls in the car and others, a Chinese spy. Why did the Democrats pull out of the bipartisan China task force I had set up? Why did Speaker Pelosi pull out of that? Why have they denied certain bills that would hold China accountable that have passed the Senate not come to the floor? Why do they focus on Silicon Valley members of Congress? Anyone want to answer these questions? I, I, I'm doing the best I can not to go Manchurian candidate on you here. <laughs> Get that? Pardon the pun. Stop. Stop. But in all seriousness, how many professors have we caught in our education system in just the last four years that turned out to be Chinese spies? Why did the vice presidential debate air in China and they blacked out the screen anytime Mike Pence spoke? 
Why does the Democratic Party remain silent on these things? Why do the big tech companies work hand in hand with China to block anything that has to do with election fraud? Why does it seem like the system I talk about all the time is constantly relaying the same messages of the American Democratic Party? No, I don't think the Democratic Party is sitting in smoke-filled rooms with the Chinese Communist Party plotting the demise of America. I'm not that guy. But there is a shocking amount of overlap between the two entities. And now we've find out Eric Swalwell is uh, getting to know a female Chinese spy. Reportedly, she got to know other members of Congress. Well, those are the ones we know about. How many are over here that we don't know about? You want to you ask these questions? I think it's important we get to the bottom of this. Not that I want to distract FBI Director Ray from digging into that big white supremacist problem, but maybe we should be rooting out some of the communists here in America. All right. That's the bad news. The good news is Joe Biden, he's still Joe Biden. And I'm grateful to the members of my COVID team that I'd like to introduce to you now who will lead the way. I'm really proud of this group. For Secretary of Health and Education Service, I nominated Javier Bacaria. You know, Javier Bashera, excuse me. He currently, the Attorney General of California, leading the second largest Justice Department in America. What are we going to do? All we, all we can do is laugh for six years. That guy's President of the United States. You know what's going to be the best? When he does when he does the uh, foreign, foreign tours and he starts going into the other countries and have to give speeches and you know he's going to be screwing up all the <laughs> names. All right. All we can do is laugh. Now, let me tell you something. Natural medicines, holistic healing approaches, they've been known to help alleviate the things that plague us, don't they? Especially as you get older. You have any joint pain? Don't lie to me. Unless you're 20, I know you do. Anxiety, there's just a little bit of that floating around. Well, Doctors Trusted CBD Company, they've been doing natural medicine since 1999. And they took the time to do something that you and I can't do. We don't have the time. We don't have the expertise. They researched the entire CBD industry because there's so much of it out there. And they found the best companies. That's why they teamed up with Be Best Organics, which is made in the USA. Go to DoctorsTrustedCBD.com. Now through the holidays, use the promo code JESSE. That actually gets you 5% off and a free lip balm. DoctorsTrustedCBD.com, promo code JESSE. We'll be back. Joining me now, as she often does, Carol Roth. She's the creator of the Future File Legacy Planning System, of which I actually own that. That's not some sponsorship. I, I, I do own that. Carol, um, I talk a lot about the nation needing an amicable divorce. Now, you're obviously uh, much more mature, although I'm sure younger, much more mature than I am. So I don't expect you to get into all that. But you probably, as a former investment banker, can give us some financial insight, uh, insight on the viability of an idea like that. Explain it to me, because I've never even thought about that part. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I mediated my parents' divorce, and that did not go particularly well. So I am sort of attuned to the uh, financial complexities when you try to break apart a unit, even though they don't necessarily see eye to eye ideologically. And the challenge is, is that the people who want to have the, the good fundamentals don't have the centers of money in this country. If you think about where the, the giant financial centers are, New York City, uh, California, Chicago, you know, those would go in one direction. So you'd have all the money and the bad ideas on one side, and then you'd have all the good ideas, but nothing to finance it. So as I've kind of tried to walk through the divorce math and think, even if you um, shared a military perhaps, or, you know, shared borders and maybe even like the EU had some 
uh, ability to move in between. The question is what happens to our 27 plus trillion dollars in debt? What happens to the pension debt? And what happens to the spending and the flow? There's a lot of complexities that go, you know, beyond Judge Judy or any sort of basic <laughs> divorce court there. And I think that would be um, even ideologically, if you could kind of go, okay, yeah, this, this is how the split makes sense. I'm not sure financially, but uh, I, I think that would be the hardest part to work out. Okay, look, I don't disagree, and I'm never going to argue with you ever about anything financial at all, because I realize that I am, I'm in the presence of my betters there. But let me just say, when I talk about the amicable divorce thing, as you see, you've gone through one, or, I mean, you've mediated one. I'm not under any, any illusion that it's going to be some, wow, this is the funnest thing I've ever done. I know it'll be miserable. I know people are going to have to give up things they love and take things they hate, like more debt than they feel like they deserve and you get a city that I really wanted. I understand that. <laughs> I just think I just think that a clean break, if you're a nation that doesn't share common values, well, that's the only reason to be a nation. There's not a second reason. If you don't share common values, then just go be two separate nations. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot of sense in that one side wants, you know, freedom and choice and the other side wants force and co coercion. The freedom and choice side, which I know is the side that you and I would be on, uh, you know, it's fine if you want to do these things over here, then just go ahead and do them. Just don't force the rest of us to do it. And I think that that theoretically should be an easy thing to get your head wrapped around. Uh, but unfortunately, it goes against central planning and the power grab. Um, so I do think ideologically, they're two very different and inconsistent scenarios, very much like my mom and dad, that we're not a great team together. Um, but yeah, it's, it, you have to work out the debt, you know, in terms of, you know, the currency, or are you both on the dollar and who has control of the dollar? Do we all just go to Bitcoin? I mean, there are a lot of very complicated things that would have um, reverberations throughout both potential new nations, both throughout the world. Um, and then, you know, it's a, a question of, of you know, things like the military and whatnot. You know, do, do you share that when you don't have common goals and ideology and maybe even a common currency? Um, very, very complicated for sure. All right. Well, look, as long as my face is on the new dollar, that's really all I care, care about. But be that as it may, Carol, we're switching gears here to masks, vaccines, things like that. I, I don't have to ask you what you think about lockdown. I'm lockdowns. I'm well aware. But we have this vaccine coming out, and I realize 90% of the country is looking forward to it. I haven't made my decision yet on it. I really don't think it's that complicated, though. Take it if you want to take it. If you don't want to take it, don't take it. Don't force anybody else to put something in their body they don't want to have put in their body. Isn't that the simplest, most easy solution possible? Yeah, I mean, and I think that that's going to be a reality for some time because I don't think that we're going to have enough doses to be able to give it to everybody, even who wants it, let alone the people who don't want it. So you know, if you believe in the concept of a herd immunity at all, whether naturally or through vaccine, it means that not every single person has to have it in order for the population at large to be protected. And so you just need to have enough of those you know, people, um, you know, in the general population that have that level of immunity. Many of us, myself included, have antibodies and already have theoretically, potentially some level of protection. Um, if we don't, then I'm not sure how the vaccine works to begin with. So I, I feel like that's the right approach. Um, again, freedom and choice versus force and coercion. Let the people take it who want to take it. And then what happens is if once it becomes accepted, assuming that, you know, nobody's grows a, throw, a third arm or their hair turns green, you know, in a few years as production catches up, maybe it becomes something people do. I mean, I didn't get the flu shot when it first came out, but now because I travel a lot and I've seen the, you know, a bunch of people have it without consequence, I get a flu shot every year. So I'm not going to line up to be the first person to take the vaccine, but maybe in a few years, you know, once it's out in the market and, you know, we see that, uh, you know, it's going okay, knock on wood, then maybe I would consider it. Well, 
I don't think we need to poo-poo having a third arm. I'd have to get my jackets <laughs> retailer, but that actually might be kind of handy. If you, but this anyway, is a be that as it may. Family show, Jesse Kelly. This is a family <laughs> show. I'm sorry, Carol. All right, all right. You're right. Focus. Let's get focused here. In all seriousness, the vaccine. Though, I don't have a problem with the way it was pushed through because they say they cut out government tape. I know the answer to this question before I even ask. But do you think maybe we learned our lesson about government red tape? We see what can be done. At least maybe that could be something good that comes from this. We see what could happen if we get government out of the way and let the private sector handle it. I, I mean. I see it. You see <laughs> it. Do the people I who know. are in charge see it? That's, you know, the the $64 trillion question. And it wasn't just, by the way, with the vaccine and expediting the vaccine, but it was with hand sanitizers. You know, once the FDA said, oh, okay, well, we don't have to go through this huge process to approve you to make hand sanitizers, a bunch of companies that were smaller came into the market to fill up all of the demand. By the way, the same thing happened with testing. There are countries like Germany where small companies were able to do millions of tests at the same time, we couldn't do anything because all of these emergency youth au uh, use authorizations that were put in place theoretically to cut down the process in this particular case actually made it longer and meant for a long period of time the CDC was the only lab that was allowed to do the test, even though you had you know Mayo Clinic and all these other places lobbying and saying, please, you know, we, we can do this, let us do this. And the government went, no, well, it's not really part of our procedure. So this should be glaringly obvious to everybody, but the people who believe in central planning and the people who believe in big government and that somehow this you know, small group of people that wouldn't get elected to the board of my condo, but somehow got elected to lead the nation are gonna make the best possible decisions instead of the free market. We have the proof, but they're they're gonna go, oh no, well, it was, it was Trump's fault. Or if it was you know Biden in there, it would have been different. But, Newsflash, it wouldn't have been any different because this is a giant behemoth that has been built and Frankensteined over many, many years. And the proof is there once again, as it's been throughout all of history and throughout all of the world, and somebody will still fumble the ball again. Carol, what if they freeze you out of society if you don't take it? I understand that we're not probably almost undoubtedly, Lord willing, we're not going to have some federal law take it. But people are concerned about that, and you're totally free to be concerned about that. I have concerns myself. What if they don't want a vaccine? Only, only it's you're not violating the law, but well, you can't come in our restaurant, you can't get on this flight, your kid can't go to school. You can freeze somebody out of society with enough cultural control, and the left has it. Well, from my own perspective, that would be the most exciting day of my life. I would have <laughs> a complete excuse to not have to interact with any other person ever again. And I would just sit on my couch and watch game shows and live happily ever after. However, for other people who did want to, strangely enough, interact with other humans in society, I don't understand why, but I support your right to do it. And I think that that would be a major issue and frankly, a constitutional issue. And if that happens, you know, we need to support those people, help them raise funds, get Ron Coleman or somebody like that on board and take that all the way to the Supreme Court because it's absolutely insane. We don't do that for things like the flu, we don't do that for other issues that are contagious. And so now to say, oh, well, you don't have this vaccine, you cannot participate, uh, you know, in a, a contract between people, you know, that that's just insanity. But some, by the way, again, some of those things are actually to people's benefit. Like if they, their kids can't go to the public schools and it forces them into a, a free market option, again, probably to their benefit. Carol Roth, thank you, ma'am. All right, we'll be back. Joining me now, Republican strategist Joseph Pinion III. Joseph, what kind of balance should the Republican Party be striking between doing whatever we have to do to find out what happened during the presidential election and also going after the Democrats hard in Georgia. And I look, I'll be honest, man, I see the presidential stuff hurting our chances in Georgia, and I also see that we should push this presidential stuff all the way. Well, look, I think we should be able to bring two messages uh, to the American people. Realistically, we should be able to synergize uh, two messages to make it one potent one. 
And the message should be very clear. If you believe that President Trump will be victorious, that what you can give to President Trump that the Supreme Court cannot give him is control over the United States Senate. And that is something that staying home or writing his name in in protest cannot do. Um, and so I think that should be the focus of every strategist who is on a plane right now trying to bilk the RNC out of dollars for work they're probably not going to end up doing anyway. We have to come together to convince the rank and file members of our party, to convince uh, those voters in Georgia who feel as if they're disenfranchised, those country boys that feel as if their government failed them, to say that they need to lean in now and vote uh, like their life depends on it because the fate of our republic may indeed hang in the balance. What do we know about the Republicans down there? Loeffler, Purdue. I know, look, at this point in time when it comes to stopping somebody like Ossoff or that nut job Warnock, it doesn't matter what about Purdue and Loeffler at this point. But what do we know about Purdue and Loeffler? Or what, what kind of Republicans are they? I mean, look, here's the truth. You know, I've, I've come to the realization I'm a, I'm a New York Republican. I believe in conservatism, but, you know, different strokes for different folks um, in different places. So I don't get to tell the people of Georgia what type of Republicans that they should be nominating to put in the United States Senate. And I think we learned the hard way in a place like Arizona that when you spit in the face of voters and shove a candidate down their throat, um, you end up losing seats uh, to Democrats who have no business being in the United States. Senate. So I think the reality is these are the Republicans that the voters of Georgia chose. And I think at this point, it's incumbent of us as conservatives around this nation who understand the true threat of socialism, who understand the true perniciousness of the policies that would be implemented by a Democratic controlled House and Senate uh, and Oval Office to make sure that irrespective of your personal feelings about the candidates, to understand that they are to be the backstop against any of these policies that would lead to pretty much the bankrupting of America and us falling behind on the precipice of trying to lead a 21st century world. Joseph, the RNC, uh, people get confused about the RNC, what it is, what it does, what it should do. I've only very half-jokingly said you should be the head of the place, and I still actually believe you should. But what does the RNC actually do? What don't they do? Well, look, I think the job of the RNC is uh, multifaceted. It's, it's to, uh, in, in many ways, in a 21st century world, you have to be the fundraising arm of the party. Uh, you have to be the tip of the spear, the, the primary messaging apparatus for the party, particularly um, in times when the party is out of power. That means in times we don't have the Oval. Um, obviously, when you have uh, the presidency, the president is the leader of the party unequivocally. Um, when you do not have the Oval Office, I think, again, um, the work of the RNC becomes that much more important uh, to make sure that we're finding good candidates. Obviously, you have a uh, Senate candidate, you have, you know, you have a Senate committee and you have uh, the NRCC and all these different uh, auxiliary bodies. Uh, but at the end of the day, the RNC is the conductor um, that orchestrates everything all the way down to your young Republicans, your teenage re Republicans, and all the way up uh, through your states, uh, your state GOPs and all all across the board. So it's very important that the RNC has a cohesive message that all the various attributes for how do we get a more diverse coalition to how do we make sure we're raising money for candidates to how are we making sure we're finding the right candidate for the right district uh, because not all candidates are right for a certain type of district. That's the work that the RNC has to do. That's the work um, that is so important because failure on any one of those points um, compromises the entire body of work. How does fundraising at a national party level work? I can't count how many times I've had somebody tell me, I'm never giving to the RNC again. Screw the RNC. I am only giving to candidates. How, do they, how does that work? How important is it for the Republican Party or for the individual candidates that the national party raise money? Uh, look, I think that it's important uh, for people to give to candidates they believe in. I think too often uh, we allow people sitting in pristine towers 
uh, to pick the candidate that looks good on paper that people on the ground know aren't worth a damn when it comes to making sure someone actually gets across the finish line and more importantly upholds the values that we hold dear. Uh, so that's supremely important. But I think it's important for you know the RNC, those Republican governors associations, they do need to have uh, dollars. I'll, I'll, I'll give you one clear example. You go back not too long ago, 2016, um, there was basically a 106-day period uh, where we had to go and get Mike Pence off the ballot as the candidate for governor, had to turn around and get Eric Holcomb off the ballot as the lieutenant nominee governor, um, on back onto the ballot as a nominee for governor, and then had 106 days to actually reintroduce himself to the, the public at large in a place like Indiana. That is the type of undertaking that really can't be done uh, by a campaign itself. If they have to do that as just one campaign wall to wall, uh, we probably have a Democratic governor of Indiana as unlikely as it seems. Uh, so I think, again, there are cases and places where the work of these governing bodies, an RNC and an RCC, um, is integral in making sure that we actually have the majorities that we celebrate on Election Day and that we crave when it comes time to govern effectively. You brought up Arizona. Well, not that long ago, I, I ran for Congress there twice and lost twice, but I ran for Congress there twice. Mm, we just had re two Republican senators there like yesterday. Now we have two Democrat senators. Joseph, if you would please elaborate what exactly happened there. I mean, I, I think one number one, you have to know your electorate. Uh, you know, for whatever people thought about John McCain, for whatever people thought about Senator Flake. Uh, there's a reason why individuals who were of that ilk found their way to be the, uh, the most prestigious elected officials of that state. Uh, and so I think it was a decision made uh, that Martha McSally would be the person um, that would carry that flag, that would carry that flame. And the voters said, uh, that they did not want her. Now, does that make, does it make her a bad person? Does that mean that she has not served this country with distinction in the military? But it does mean that when the voters speak, we have the opportunity and also the responsibility to listen to them. And so we decided we weren't going to listen to them. We basically uh, thwarted the will of the people. We put a woman in, in the United States Senate, appointed her after the people said they did not want her to go there. And we find ourselves confused when for the second time in less than two and a half years, they have rejected her at the polls. So I think at some basic level, the lesson to be learned is that number one, know the electorate. And then also number two, listen to the voters. The voters said they didn't really want her. We didn't listen. And now we've turned the reliable red state blue. Why do Democrats join together better than Republicans? And I, and I mean this when I say this. A, a, a feminist group will join with a teacher's union. will join with, well, you know, a, a, a steel fitters union. will join with a transgender union. The, they, they, they're just, they seem to have these groups with nothing in common whatsoever. But they will join whenever there's a common cause. I don't see that on the right. Why? Well, you know, it's funny because, you know, the old adage was that, you know, Democrats fall in love and Republicans fall in line. And I think if, if in, in large part uh, for a great deal of, of my life and even your life, that was true. Uh, something's wrong and rotten in Denmark right now because it seems that we've forgotten that the objective is to win. And you can have all the great ideas for conservatism, but at the end of the day, conservative ideas sitting on the couch can't help a damn person. So I think we just have to understand intuitively that, yeah, are there people in Congress who are Republicans, who are conservative, that, you know, aren't really my flavor, aren't my cup of tea? Yeah. Am I going to probably give them money? No. But my responsibility is to recognize the broader objective um, which is to make sure that we're getting conservative policies implemented, but also beyond that, uh, making sure that you know we're holding back uh, the type of policies that we know concretely, absolutely will hurt people, absolutely will take this nation in a direction it was never intended to go in, uh, policies that have never worked in the history of the world. And when you view politics through that prism, it makes it a lot easier for us to be able to find common ground, to work together with individuals that maybe you wouldn't vote for to be your congressman, but you sure as heck should be able to support in the effort of finding common ground to pass policy that's going to improve people's lives. Joseph Pinion III, as always, awesome. Thank you, bud.
Thanks, brother. Appreciate you. I know you think I'm a cold-hearted jerk and that's all true, but these coming home videos, when our troops get to come home, they get me. It's easy for you and I to forget. Even people who've been over. I, I've been over, but it's still easy to forget. As we luxuriate here in America, we go about our daily lives. There are people separated from their families, over there serving us. And man, when they get to come home, it gets me. <laughs> Quit crying. All right. I'll see you tomorrow.